for joining us um, here at the ANAE Learning Academy. Um, during this um, webinar, um, you will be muted. And so if you have any questions or comments, you can put them into the uh, Q&A or the chat at the bottom of your screen. And um, we will get to those at the end. <clears throat> Doug, that's OK still at the end? Yep. Yep. Yes, it is. Okay, so Thank now you. I'd like to introduce you to um, our presenter today, Doug Mudd. Um, Doug is the curator of the ANA's Money Museum, and he has been since 2004. He's the author of numerous numismatic lectures, exhibits, and publications, and writes a regular column for the numismatist, um, and has been an ANA summer seminar instructor since 2002. Um, Doug today is presenting Mediterranean coinage through the ages. And Doug, I'm gonna let you go ahead and get started. Thanks, Paula. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning or early afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, this is a, uh, an interesting talk because it's a little different than our normal uh, talking about specific coinages from specific areas or countries. Uh, this is a survey basically showing how coinage can really illustrate the history of the uh, Mediterranean I'm going to share the screen right now, and okay. So with that, uh, let's go on our little adventure, our tour of the Mediterranean over time. I'm going to get my controls under control here. Okay. So from the earliest times, water has been the cheapest and easiest way to transport goods and people. For the peoples of the Mediterranean littoral, this fact has been both a blessing and a curse. For better or for worse, the peoples of the Mediterranean have been linked ever since the first bold adventurers hollowed out a log and paddled out into the horizon in search of adventure, conquest, or trade. Uh, Archaeology has been able to show links between widely separated Mediterranean peoples from the third millennium BC, so 5,000 years ago, basically, links that could only have been made in boats. From the invention of coinage in the 7th century BC in Lydia, coins play an increasingly important part in allowing archaeologists to date and identify the origins of the remains encountered at these ancient sites. The spread of coinage uh, provides primary evidence for the study of the Mediterranean basis, basin and its associated regions as a single unit, because these coins, when you find them in these different sites, show the connections that were made and uh, allow us to understand better what was going on um, as people adventured out and started speaking to each other and trading with each other. So uh, here's a, a map of the Greek colonies. The Greeks were basically the first peoples uh, to adopt coinage uh, on a wholesale basis where they, they adopted coinage within 50 or 60 years of the first coins appearing in Lydia. And one of the things that I have to clarify is that Greece at this time was, was not ethnically or um, culturally limited to what is today Greece. Uh, the Greeks had spread out from the, the homeland of Greece by the seventh century uh, BC to uh, occupy the huge area. As you can see here, this is a map that's basically the, the sixth century BC, but they, from a very early date, they had occupied the uh, Western portions of the uh, Anatolia, what is today Turkey, including vast areas of the uh, coastal regions across the Northern Mediterranean, uh, some of the southern Mediterranean, and um, going all the way uh, west in, onto the borders of Spain, uh, where they came into conflict in, in Italy and in Spain with Carthage. So coinage spread along the coastal regions of the Mediterranean, at first very rapidly along cultural and ethnic lines among the Greeks, the Greeks and their colonies, and then more slowly into coastal regions controlled by the Phoenicians, and Romans, and then inland to the Celts and the peoples of Asia Minor, Western Asia, uh, Western Asia, and along the major trade routes. Within a hundred years of its adoption by the Greeks, coinage could be found from the eastern shores of the Black Sea to the eastern coast of Spain. 
By the end of the sixth century BC, coinage was being used and produced all around the coast of the Mediterranean with the most common early trade coin being the silver stater of Corinth and its colonies. So we'll talk about Corinth a little bit. Uh, this rates as one of the first quote unquote world trade coinages in, if you accept that the, the world, the known world at the time was small, uh, relatively speaking. And so these coins are limited to the Northern and Western Mediterranean mostly, though they do expand beyond that and could be found in the Eastern Mediterranean. So according to mythology, Corinth was founded by Corinthos, a descendant of the god Helios, uh, the sun god, while other myths suggest that it was founded by the goddess Ephira, a daughter of the, of the Titan Oceanus. Thus, the ancient name of the city, which was Ephira. There is evidence that the original city was destroyed around 2000 BC and replaced by what became known as Corinthos by the Dorians. In classical times, Corinth rivaled Athens and Thebes in wealth, and based on the Ismian traffic and trade, uh, had a wide influence on both the Ad Adriatic and the Aege Aegean seas. Until the mid-6th century, Corinth was a major exporter of black figure pottery to city-states around the Greek world. And at this point, pottery was, for this early period, pottery is a major archaeological indicator for dating and for identifying who was at particular sites. Athenian potters later came to dominate the market. In 570 BC, the inhabitants started to use silver coins called colts or foals for the image of Pegasus on the reverse. These coins became especially common in the Western, on the obverse, I'm sorry, in the Western Mediterranean through trade and through imitations produced by Corinthian colonies in Italy, Sicily, and the islands of the Adriatic. Corinthian coinage started a precedent of freezing coin designs in order to promote long-term acceptance based on familiarity combined with confidence in the met metallic purity and consistency of the coinage. Over time, these characteristics promoted imitation, a sure sign of a successful coinage. So this, this idea of freezing is something that we see that right into the modern day. You can look at uh, United States paper money, for example, which is essentially almost the same since the uh, early 20th century, since the 19, late 1920s. Um, and the primary reason for this is to promote use of the money by people not familiar with the language or even sometimes the country. Uh, it was enough that these coins and later paper money are recognizable by people that are not part of that empire, that nation, uh, and that they have confidence in it. And in order to promote that, you keep the coins the same. So Corinthians produced these coins for hundreds of years with basically the same design with minor modifications over the years. So you can see an archaic example uh, at the upper left, for example, 550 to 515 BC, the Pegasus is very stylized, looks very much like, uh, well, what's known as archaic art, but it's related to what was going on in the Middle East, um, places like Assyria, the art is similar. Then you get uh, the slightly later, and the the Pegasus is starting to show more motion. It's in flight. Um, you replace the punch on the reverse with a punch that has the head of Athena added to it. And as time goes on, you can see how the style changes. And these coins would be found typically throughout the uh, coastal regions of Italy, Sicily, on the islands of the Adriatic, into Greece itself, and to some extent, uh, further east along the northern shores uh, uh, as you approach the Black Sea. And they would also sometimes appear in other areas, but that's where they were most commonly located. Athens is the next great uh, world trade coinage. Now, Athenian coins um, became extremely widespread and uh, also extremely famous for centuries 
uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, Athens became the producer of the first uh, trade coins because it had a an excellent location in the harbor, positioned as it was on an extension of the Greek mainland into the Aegean Sea. Its harbor was a natural stopping point for merchants. Second, Athens was fortunate to be located near the rich silver mines of Mount Laurion. These mines provided silver in great abundance throughout the classical period. So over for over uh, 250 years, uh, silver was being mined from that, those mines at a, at a large amount. This allowed the Athenians to produce huge numbers of high quality silver coins for domestic use and for export. Third, Athens was able to extend its power over the whole of Attica, the, the, the coastal region uh, where Athens is located was, was by Greek standards relatively very large, which gave it a uh, large economic base and allowed it to become a major manufacturer of trade goods and produce sufficient food for its own needs. Athenian tetradrams were produced with essentially the same design for over three centuries and in such huge numbers and consistency that they were accepted as the most trusted coin trade coin in a huge area, encompassing most of the Mediterranean and extending deep into Asia. These coins, nicknamed owls, because of the owl on them, obviously, became a recognized and reliable standard for trade throughout the ancient world and were heavily imitated in many areas from Southern Arabia out to as far away as Afghanistan and the borders of India. The coinage of Athens continued to be a trade standard until uh, around the, the second, first century BC, uh, though they were partially supplanted by the coins of Alexander, with few changes in the basic design over the whole of that period. The head of Athena re remained basically archaic in style uh, with only minor changes in the helmet, hair, and earrings until the second century BC. On the reverse, the major changes included the early addition of a crescent moon to represent the Athenian victory over the Persians at the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC, and later the addition of magistrates names and symbols during the second century BC. So th these coins um, today are still extremely common. They're, they're, so many were made, in fact, that it's proven impossible so far to do die studies. It's every time you find a new hoard of Athenian tetradrams, uh, the new dies located and are so numerous and there are so few matching dies with other series that unlike most of the ancient Greek coins, no one's been able to create a die sequence uh, for more than just a minuscule portion of the series. Uh, one of the extreme rarities and um, famous rarities for the Athenian coins are the decadrams that were produced for a short while in the, uh, for the 460s BC, basically. Uh, there's, there's a nice example of it. And all of the, the Athenian coins from the largest to the very smallest, the, the trihemi tartarions and smaller, which are basically the size of, a, of a, the opening on a pen, very tiny silver pieces, feature owls one way or another. The owl was important to Athens because Athens' uh, patron goddess was Athena, and from which they got their name. And the avatar of Athens, of Athena, was the owl, which is where we get the idea that owls are wise. It's an ancient connection to um, Greek religious beliefs where Athena was the goddess of wisdom and her avatar thus partook of that wisdom. Now we'll move on to the coinage of Alexander the Great. Now, Alexander was the first to create a widespread coinage to the same standard and designs at multiple mints throughout a vast region. These coins became standard currency throughout his empire and beyond along the trade routes of the East and West. The designs of these coins were copied for centuries until the advent of the Roman Empire and the introduction of its imperial coinage, which uh, ended the issue of these uh, various coins. The coinage was made possible 
through Alexander's conquest of the Persian Empire, the Persians had accumulated vast amounts of silver and gold at various treasuries, uh, particularly at their capital of Persepolis, where there were over 3,000 tons of gold and silver were reportedly found. This created a, a huge reserve, which allowed uh, Alexander and his uh, magistrates to produce a huge coinage that changed the nature and availability of coinage throughout the region from basically Egypt and uh, the Balkans all the way to India and then even beyond through uh, third party trade. Alexander's coinage was the most extensive and uniform of the ancient world before the establishment of the Roman Empire. And the coinage consisted unusually of coins all the way from gold staters and double staters through silver, the tetradrams, drams, and then on to token bronze coins. Uh, Greek coinage, uh, for example, the, the Athenians or the Corinthians, um, ne for the major coinages, never included gold as a regular issue. Gold had been um, an emergency issue uh, and bronze coins were late comers in uh, the Greek coin system, basically appearing in the fourth century BC. So these coins were unique for the time in that they were produced at the, using the same de designs at dozens of mints located throughout Alexander's vast empire. The design of Alexander's tetradrams and, and drams reflect his mythical ancestry. So these are being used as propaganda to promote his uh, right to rule and uh, his ancestry. The obverse features the head of Hercules with the skin of the Nemean lion. Healing it was one of the famed labors of Hercules, and so it's always been associated with Hercules. Hercules was, was claimed as one of Alexander's ancestors, and since he was the son of Zeus, chief, god, chief of the Greek gods, Alexander placed Zeus enthroned on the reverse of his coins, holding an eagle, which was, the, was Zeus's avatar. Thus, he pointed out that he, had, he was related to the gods and this gave him the right to rule. And here is a nice selection of the coinage that was issued during his time. And these coins appeared throughout the Mediterranean, particularly the East Mediterranean where his empire was, but well beyond as well. So in, in Europe, in the... Uh, Celtic areas, uh, Alexander the Great's coins were imitated. You had the coins appearing as far as the uh, western shores of India, and occasionally even as far as China through the trade networks that were developing along the Silk, Silk Road. Here's a map where you can see what Alexander's empire looked like at his death, and how it divided up soon afterwards. The Hellenistic era began with Alexander the Great's death in 323 BC and lasted until the Roman takeover of Ptolemaic Egypt in 30 BC. Alexander left a world permanently changed in which Greek language and culture would form the intellectual foundation for the next 300 years and beyond. Greek culture dominated from Italy to the Western borders of India. Greek was the common language of diplomacy, government, and scholarship throughout this vast region. At Alexander's death, his empire was split between his generals. Four decades of civil war resulted in the creation of three major kingdoms, the Macedonian, Seleucid, and Ptolemaic kingdoms, along with numerous smaller ones known collectively as the Hellenistic kingdoms. Each developed its own distinctive coinage based on the use of realistic portraits of the reigning monarch, along with legends uh, that included their names, accomplishments, and their attributes. These were intended to make sure that the people they ruled and people beyond knew who their king or queen was and what, uh, what their latest accomplishments were, whether they be uh, successful battles or just prosperity, uh, good luck for their people, all those kinds of things. The use of realistic portraiture by the rulers of the Hellenistic kingdoms was the final numismatic uh, new element introduced by the Greeks before the advent of the Roman Empire. 
These portraits fo form the foundation from which Roman imperial coinage would develop from the first century BC until the end of the Western uh, Roman Empire in the in the fifth century AD. Here we'll talk about Roman coins for a little while. So uh, the Romans were latecomers to to the issuance of coins. Basically, central Italy uh, above the areas where the Greeks had settled, uh, they had so many different cities in southern Greece and in Sicily that the region became known as Magna Graecia, Greater Greece, because there were actually more Greeks living in the area and they were wealthier than the, the homeland. So uh, the Romans had examples of coinage from an earlier period, but Italy in general and the Romans in particular uh, saw no real need for coinage. They were basically an agrarian society. They they relied on farming. They didn't do a lot of long distance trade. Their trade was uh, mostly short, local, and really didn't require coinage. However, the Punic Wars became a watershed event in the development of Roman coinage. The stresses of the, of the first Punic War uh, forced the Romans to introduce the first coins. And then the second Punic War permanently changed the Roman uh, economic system by creating a permanent uh, need for coined money for the first time. So in order to pay the troops, uh, the Punic, the Second Punic War in particular, uh, required the normal uh, Roman military system, which depended on the soldier farmers, uh, to change because these these soldiers were no longer able to go back to their farms and farm during the normal farming season or the harvest. Uh, they were away from home for too long. So the Romans had to find a way to pay the armies. And coins became the, the way to do that. The most lasting change uh, once they started coinage was the introduction of a new denomination the silver denarius in about 210 BC, uh, towards the latter part of the Second Punic War is when they issued these coins. The denarius itself was, was to last essentially unchanged for the next 400 years, though the designs changed over time, the, the size and basic weight of the coins did not. And they became the standard co trade coinage throughout the Mediterranean and beyond uh, from the late Republican Roman period uh, to the period when Rome had conquered all of the Mediterranean basin and uh, mandated that their coins were legal tender. Roman coins have been found in India and even China along with imitations produced in regions where Rome was just a myth, showing the trust that they had earned. As time went on, the denarii developed from using standardized imagery representing the Republic uh, Republican ideals and, and Republican history to more sophisticated imagery illustrating Roman uh, mythology, often celebrating the accomplishments of the ancestors of those responsible for the issues. So we have some examples here. The, to the upper left is a standard coin of the, of the earlier period where you have uh, basically Mars, uh, God of War, representing Rome, and you have the Dioscuri, the twin gods who uh, represented Roman uh, victories and luck, basically. The, the Dioscuri appeared at a critical time in early Roman Republican history uh, and brought victory to the Roman army. And so the Romans uh, venerated them highly and used them on the coins as a symbol. Uh, as time went on, the coins began to change. And to the upper right, you see a coin that's um, starting to celebrate various elements, uh, including family elements. So this is Diana, the, the goddess of hunting, who's related to the issuer of this coin, A. Postumius. Um, so now, the Romans are showing coins that illustrate 
parts of family histories that are related to the history of the Republic and the successes they had. But one thing the Romans always avoided was the use of personal imagery in the Republican period. Why? Because Rome, when it was founded, was a republic. Not when it was founded. They became a republic, and when they began issuing coins as a republic, uh, they were surrounded by a world dominated by kingdoms. All of the kingdoms had coinage that were uh, that were the personal property, basically, of the kings and queens, and they showed the kings and queens on them. A republic was based on the idea that the republic was more important than any individual, and the Romans uh, thus created a tradition of not showing individuals on their coinage. But as time went on, uh, it was okay to show the history of Rome and relations to the ancestors of the people responsible for issuing the coinage. Uh, the first series where you start to see very close uh, personal uh, references uh, are the coinages of Scylla, who was the, the uh, basically uh, one of the first of the what would become known as the imperators, the successful generals who began to dominate the uh, Roman political scene from the 90s uh, BC up until the end of the Republic with Augustus's uh, ascension to imperial power in 31 BC. So here we have a coin of Faustus Cornelius Sulla, uh, which features Diana right and illustrated to the left Faustus uh, with Aletus to the left. And there's on the reverse, you have uh, actually, this is yes, the Sulla Togit, uh, and he's on a raised seat. He's got two kings, the king of Mauritania uh, to the right, uh, to the left, actually, basically kneeling and, and presenting an olive branch, and to the right, Jugartha, the king of Numidia, kneeling to the left, his hands tied behind him. This was a reference to uh, Sulla's basically uh, conquering most of North Africa by defeating these two kings and becoming um, an imperator. And uh, this enabled him to dominate Roman uh, political life for the next decade or so, and also started a series of civil wars as Marius, uh, Sulla's original patron, uh, took offense and uh, started to become his rival. This, so these coins began to celebrate Roman individuals, but they were still a part of the trade network and were um, circulated through vast areas of the Roman Empire as it existed at the time, plus beyond. The last coin on this page is a coin of Julius Caesar, and Julius Caesar finally broke with the Republican coin traditions of not showing an individual, because it suggests that the individual is more powerful, more important than the Republic, by placing his image on the coins as dictator for life. This type is the first portrait denarius of Julius Caesar, struck in the first half of January 44 BC. His title on the issue, uh, Dictator Quartum, basically is the title he received before he became dictator, dictator for life. Uh, so these are the coins that you would have seen during the Republican period as it transferred into the imperial period. And here we have some of the examples of the Roman imperial coins that would be seen throughout what became the Roman Empire, uh, completely dominating the, the whole of the Mediterranean and beyond. So here we have an initial example of imperial coinage. Uh, soon after um, the traditional date of the start of the Roman Empire in 31 BC, basically when Augustus had put down all of his rivals and reorganized the coinage, here we have a silver denarius of Augustus with a realistic portrait of 
Augustus as a young man, which he was at this point. And then we have a Capricorn, right? Augustus was was a Capricorn. He was born uh, under the sign that sign, and, uh, and there's a cornucopia on its back, and a rudder and a globe to the front, basically alluding to uh, Augustus's control of the of the Roman world, and by ending the civil wars, his bringing plenty and represented by cornu a cornucopia. Uh, um, so this is all giving the benefits of why Augustus is good to have as the ruler of the Roman world. And then we go on to uh, how the coins developed over time. During the next century, essentially as the rulers, as the emperors uh, took power, it became more and more important for them to celebrate a who they were and then what they had done what their titles were under augustus it was less necessary because he was basically the last one standing uh and he had earned fame by traveling throughout much of the roman world and so he his name was well known and it was less important to give details whereas under Trajan, for example, uh, the the legends get longer and longer. So we have uh, a coin with a very long legend, basically saying this is Trajan the Augustus, who's conquered Germany, Dacia. Uh, he's been a the consul for six times, and he's the, the father of his country, et cetera, et cetera. On the reverse, it's it's also very clear that he, uh, why he's great. Well, he's the best of, of princes, and he has created the Via Tri Triana, the the road that would connect uh, the eastern uh, parts of the Balkan to the western parts of the well, the eastern parts of the empire to the western parts of the empire through the Balkans. And uh, this becomes the very epitome of the typical Roman coinage for centuries where the emperor's deeds and portrait are shown and then whatever particular qualities that they want to, to celebrate on the reverse. So these coins become the standard that you would see throughout the region depicted here for basically 500 years. As international trade between the East and West developed, coins began to appear further and further from its places of origin. Traditionally, the tendency was for bullion, increasingly in the form of gold and silver coins, to pass from the West to the East in exchange for silk, textiles, and spices. Throughout the period from the first century AD through the 10th century AD, the most reliable and widely accepted coinage was produced by the Roman Empire and its successor, the Byzantine Empire. So now we'll talk about the Byzantines a little bit as we move forward. Um, this is essentially what the Byzantine coins looked like. One of the, the key elements that occurs is that as supplies of silver dwindled in the Roman Empire due to declining production and the migration of vast amounts of silver from the, from the West to the East, gold be began to play an increasing role in international trade and and um international trade and through massive payments that were made to marauding barbarian hordes in the later roman period to keep them from invading now this uh importance of gold uh is in part because of the need for trade but it's also in, in part because silver became less and less common as I said, through the declining production and the, the, the vast amounts that had been sent to the East. This problem starts appearing in as early as the late fourth century BC, uh, AD, um, as you see debasements of Roman coins uh, and also increases over time so that by the eighth century uh, and ninth century, Silver is extremely rare. It's not being used in coinage very much anywhere. 
uh, it, it was as time would go on uh, in the 10th century, in the 9th century a little bit, it would revive in the, in the former parts of the Western Roman Empire, but only slowly and in relatively small amounts. As the Western Empire collapsed, the Eastern Empire gradually transformed into what we now call the Byzantine Empire. Gold, Ari, and Saladi have been found in burials uh, in Western China and in hordes of coins in Western India as well, showing just how far these coins extended. Uh, so the trade network that had been established under the Roman Empire uh, continued to exist and in some cases even expand exp beyond some of the areas that, where they'd been before. These coins were immensely important in, in international trade and the Persians, first under the Parthians and then under the Sasanians, were the classic middlemen in this trade between Europe and China. And China. One of the reasons why um, this trade grew so much from basically the first century AD on was that for the first time you had a large stable Western empire, the Roman empire. And in the East, you had the expansion of China through Central Asia. So that around the first century AD um, with the advent of the Parthian empire, you actually had the ability to travel between three organized and relatively um, safe empires uh, where traders could travel from one end of uh, the Eurasian continent to the other uh, without the uh, basically disorganized and uh, barbarian, nomadic tribes and others in control. And this this is what enabled what we now know of as the Silk Road uh, to flourish and establish this, a, a network stretching for thousands of miles across this vast area. So uh, anyway, with the Persians and the Parthians, their coins became uh, basically they were, they were coins that were not used in the long distance trade as much, uh, but they dominate the central areas, whereas the Roman coinage uh, tends to go eastwards and be found in places like India and China. China did not use silver and gold in trade, and India and China both traded commodities to the west, so Indian and, and Chinese coins are rarely found in the West, they are found in the Middle East to an extent, but it was the commodities that were more important in that direction. Now we'll go to the Byzantine mints. Here's a, a nice map of the Indian, uh, the Byzantine mints that shows where they were all struck, but it also shows the extent of the Byzantine Empire at its early period before it lost the Western areas, including Italy. Spain, France, and North Africa, uh, except for Egypt, to the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths and Franks and other Germanic tribes that invaded during the er that era. This created a essentially a um, a blank as far as coinage goes in the western parts of the Mediterranean for centuries, and it wouldn't be until basically the tenth century that coins start to appear in anywhere near approaching the amounts they had appeared earlier uh, under the Roman and Byzantine empires. With the advent of Islam in the 7th century AD, the traditional patterns of trade began to, tra to change in the Mediterranean area. Islam introduced a new political element into the ethnic, religious, and li linguistic mix of the ancient world. The new the new religion rose as a politically dominant power that was able to conquer a huge swath of territory with, within its first hundred years. Basically, they defeated the Byzantines and they defeated the Sassanids. Uh, the Byzantines were not conquered totally, but the, uh, the Sassanian Empire collapsed under the Arab onslaught. The Arabs at first did little to change the status quo they found in the various areas that they conquered. 
But over time, as they assimilated their conquests and learned how to administer them, they began to make changes. Among the spurs for change was a need to counterbalance the Christian symbolism of Byzantine coinage. The first purely Islamic coinage was issued at the very end of the 7th century AD, by the end, and by the end of the 8th century, the gold dinar began to replace and challenged Byzantine gold as the major trade coinage of the Eastern Mediterranean and the Southern areas. The dinar was first struck by Abd al-Malik as part of his coinage reforms aimed at producing an Islamic coinage type acceptable to the religious um, restrictions uh, required by the religion. It was based on the Byzantine solidus and remained the standard gold denomination of the Islamic world right up to the 19th century. So here we have some examples. Uh, an early period, period uh, solidus, basically, it's a copy of a Byzantine solidus with very few changes. Uh, but essentially, it's the under the Umayyad Caliphate, under Muawiyah I, this coin uses the coins of Heraclius and Constantine, which had been issued a few decades earlier. Uh, and this, basically the same designs, the, the writing is not perfect. It's, it copies the writing that existed, but is, is not very legible. Um, it's, it's starting to be less legible. The one major change is that they took the cross at the top of the steps and took off the top part. So now it just becomes a, looks like a letter T at the top of the steps. Uh, this is the first element of taking away some of the Christian um, symbolism. Uh, then Abdallah Malik, one of the last of the Umayyad Cal Caliphate issued the gold dinar at the right and what the Arabs did at this point was uh, use inscriptions at the center, which are quotations from the Quran. And then uh, they name the, na the caliph and they write out the date rather than use uh, numbers uh, to write out the date. They, they actually wrote it out as words. And so you'll see that on the reverses where the, they have the date written across the bottom, typically on the outer edge. As time went on, the coins developed along these lines. Since Islam uh, was against the use of graven images of, of people or, or God or, or anything else, they stuck to writing and one of the interesting elements of, of Islamic coinage is how the writing developed in, into very elaborate different forms that was used on the coins often. Here, an Abbasid coin of, of al Muqtafi uh, shows how uh, the legends developed into two different circles and sometimes even more circles around the edge and the central uh, quotations essentially stay either similar. Uh, typically on the obverse, you'd have this the quotation, there is no God but God, and his name is Allah, is, is, stays the same. The reverse quotations can change depending on the various um, caliphates, the various dynasties, and um, religious sects that developed later on. So these are the coins that you would start to see across the Southern Mediterranean and into places like Italy and Sicily and uh, dominating in the Eastern Mediterranean. Here's an example of the different uh, parts of the Abbasid Caliphate where the Abbasids were no longer in total control politically of the whole region of the um, Islamic world, you, you start to see different break off dynasties that are re represent political uh, separations. And all of them would have issued their own coinage, similar to but not exactly the same as those issued at the center of the Abbasid 
Caliphate uh, in Baghdad in modern Iraq. So after the, the revival of the Western former areas of the, the Roman Empire, uh, basically Christian Europe started to revive and increase trade. They needed coins. Well, the decline of the Byzantine military and economic power during the 12th century um, resulted in the rise of new trade coins. The, the West had relied to the extent that they needed coins on Byzantine coinage. Um, and then slowly over the period from the 8th century to the 11th century, they began to issue small uh, silver coins based on the old denarius, but of much lighter weight. They, they became known as what we call the penny today. Well, for trade, new coins needed to be developed as this trade uh, expanded. The first of these was the Fiorino, Fiorino de Oro, or the Florin, which was introduced in Florence uh, in 1252. It quickly became a standard gold coin as the Byzantines continued to debase their own gold coins as their uh, economic and military situation worsened. Uh, with especially with the advent of the Seljuk Turks and after the, the their major defeat at Manzikert, which uh, essentially meant that all of what is now Turkey, central Turkey, became dominated by the Turkish uh, tribes of the time. Eventually, the Ottomans would take over and become their their final enemy that took over the last parts of the Byzantine Empire. Now, the, the, the Fiorino de Oro, or the Florin, features a lily, which is a symbol of the, the city of Florence on the obverse, and a figure of St. John on the reverse. St. John was the patron saint of uh, Florence. At the time, Mediterranean trade was dominated by the Byzant, which was the colloquial name for the, the dinars of the various Islamic and Crusader states. Uh, the, the Fiorino, proving to be a sound and reliable coin, soon overcame the Byzantine popularity, uh, especially since they were not subject to uh, debasement as uh, the various uh, issuers of the Byzants uh, had begun debasing their coins depending on their particular needs at the moment. Uh, this allowed the, the Florin to become the first European gold coinage since the decline of the Roman of the Byzantine solidus in the 11th century. The type was imitated throughout Europe with vast numbers struck not only in Florence, but in Hungary, France, and Spain as well. These early imitations generally conformed to the lily saint type with later issues gradually developing more local types while still retaining the Florentine weight standard. Now to the right, you'll see Venice issued its own coinage known as the Ducato or Ducat, so named because of the uh, ruler of Venice was known as a Doge and on the coins themselves, they have uh, the Roman form of it, the Ducat as in Ducatus. Um, so in 1284, they issued this coin after the continued debasements of the Byzantine gold hyperperons had forced the need for something reliable for them to use in their expanding trade networks. The, on their coins, the doge is, so, is shown kneeling before St. Mark, the patron saint of Venice, and receiving the standard of Venice from him. The legend on the left identifies the saint as uh, San, Santos Marcus of, of Venice, or the patron saint of Venice, and the legend on the right identifies the doge with his title Dux in the field, which is where in the Western world in English, we get the name Duke. On the reverse, Christ stands among a field of stars in an oval frame with a legend, O Christ, let this duchy which you rule be dedicated to you. The, the Venetian ducat became the preferred gold coinage of the Eastern Mediterranean trade for centuries until Napoleon ended the Republic in 1797. And uh, 
as time moved forward during the uh, 16th, 17th centuries, a new coinage appeared that became ubiquitous throughout the world and to some extent in the Mediterranean as well because of the power that the, Span the Spanish Empire wielded through Italy and Sicily and the Western Mediterranean. So these coins were made possible by two things, the discovery of new silver mines in Europe, the reopening of old Roman mines uh, through the development of new technology, which allowed uh, uh, the extraction of silver from less uh, pure ores. Uh, and more importantly, the conquest of the new world, which provided the impetus for the development of the next international trade coinage to be used in the Mediterranean, the Spanish dollar or eight real piece. It also revolutionized coinage throughout Europe. Uh, for the first time, silver coins uh, moved from basically quarter size to what we're familiar with today as the dollar size or 38 millimeter, 40 millimeter uh, silver coins. There was enough silver around that large high intrinsic value silver coins could be used uh, in trade in place of using the, the gold coins um, which had been used by the uh, Muslim states and by the Byzantine Empire. One of the, the benefits was that these coins now allowed for a much larger area on which to actually um, do more intricate and often beautiful designs. So here's an example of, of the development of Spanish coins. So you see the the earlier uh, eight real pieces, and this is a cob type, uh, basically fairly crude, intended uh, for fast production and used for trade without too much attention to the beauty um, and messages on it. Then you have uh, in 1732, you have the introduction of the uh, pillar dollar, and I've got the wrong date on the uh, the portrait dollar, which was actually introduced in, in 1760. But um, you have the, the development of the coins, and these these coins literally became world the first world trade coins because you could find them across the Mediterranean, but also across the world in uh, anywhere from China to Europe and the Americas. And here is a map that shows you how the trade developed. So these are the trade networks that were used. And basically the, the most common coin by far that you would see on the ships following these routes would have been the Spanish pieces of eight. And then the final chapter of the story which we will be covering today, we, we're, we're not covering the 20th century, is the Maria Teresa Toller. So the Spanish dollar began to be replaced in North and East Africa and the Middle East during the 18th century by the Maria per Teresa Toller, which through a strange set of circumstances had its design frozen as it, was, as it was at the time of Maria Teresa's death in 1780. The fact that the design remained unchanged in every detail became an important element in the coin's popularity and acceptance as a legitimate trade coinage throughout a vast region for almost 200 years. In fact, the Austrian mint is still producing Maria Theresa dollars to this day, though they have not been used as legal tender in Austria since 1851 and are no longer officially used as a currency in any other country. However, um, the, these coins were first introduced as a world trade coin in 1741. They were named after the Empress Maria Theresa, who ruled in Austria, um, Austria, Hungary, and Bohemia from 1740 to 1780. And, it, and her portrait is on the coin. On September 19, 1857, the Emperor Francis Joseph of Austria declared the Maria Theresa Toller to be an official trade coinage after taking a legal tender status within the Austrian Empire, um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. 
So the, the Maria Theresa Tyler became the most common, was most commonly to be found throughout the Arab world, especially in Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Muscat, and Oman, and in Africa, East Africa, and India. The US even produ produced counterfeit uh, dollars for use in the Japanese occupied Indonesia during World War II, as it was still a performed, preferred form of currency, as did various other governments at different times, including the British, the Italians, and others. So the Maria Theresa dollar was produced by numerous different entities, and um, it was being used throughout a, a vast region, uh, particularly uh, towards the end of its life uh, in Eastern Africa, where the last uh, evidence, direct evidence of it being used as a currency comes during the 1960s and, and even a little later in the remote areas of Eastern Africa, where the coins could still be found. They were being made into jewelry, but also being used in trade. And the last uh, commercial orders for the Maria Theresa Thaler uh, occurred around 1960 at the Austrian Mint, when large, uh, a, large a couple of large orders were made by Middle Eastern uh, entities for use in trade. So, and today you can still buy them. They're still being produced by the Austrian Mint as a collector's piece, as a as an, uh, a nice souvenir sort of item, but they, they follow the same standards as they, they always did. And here's an interesting map that shows you just how extensive this could be. So the, you'll see on here that the Habsburg Mints within Europe and then the non-Habsburg Mints that include places across uh, the Middle East. So you'll see the Naj, Kuwait, Al Hijaz, and even in China and Bombay, these coins were produced. Down in the south, you see Mozambique produce them and other places. So these coins appeared all over the place and give us a nice stopping for, point for the study of um, coins that dominated Mediterranean train, trade and what they tell us about history uh, throughout that region. So with that, I will end my, my presentation and open it up to anybody who has questions. Please send them um, through the chat and we can go from there. Yeah, thank you so much, Doug. Um, yeah, if anybody has questions, you can pop those into that chat bo button at the bottom or in the Q&A, either one works. Um, I wanna say um, thank you everybody that was here on the e this eLearning Academy uh, webinar. Doug does one about a month, so he'll be doing one in December as well. So make sure to check back um, on the website for that. Um, money.org and just go to the eLearning Academy. Um, I don't see any questions popping in, so I'm just going to see, Doug, did you want to say anything else or? Well, thank you for, for uh, joining me in this tour of the Mediterranean. Uh, hopefully, if you do have any questions, you can reach out and ask them later. It's it's an, a different way of looking at the coins. I I thought of this a few years ago as something uh, sort of a novel way to approach this because it's a region rather than a certain uh, country or, or empire. And it's a region that's been dominated by different coins at different times. And these coins really do tell us stories about what was going on and how people were connected by this uh, inland sea. So. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting region always, so. Thank you so much. And I will say, hope everybody has a great day. And I hope to see some of you back. Bye.